Good morning, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Sunday, the 8th of October. Just getting ready for Walid Alley in the minefield. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. Those are the sounds of Las Vegas this week joining the long and ever-growing list of American cities to have suffered mass gun violence. Earlier this week, the United States experienced one of the worst mass shootings in its history, a massacre that left 59 people dead and more than 500 others wounded. So you've been following some of the coverage surrounding this, I wonder if you can notice that just about everything surrounding this event is mysterious. Why did the shooter, Stevie Paddock, do it? Why are guns that powerful on the market? Why won't the United States tighten its unconscionably lax gun laws? Well, even though these are mysterious and they leave some of us at a loss for words on this show, we're gonna give it a crack anyway. This is the minefield. I'm Scott Stevens. My host, uh, my co-host, Wally Dali, I think he's in a condition of post-euphoric, uh, almost, I, I think he's actually comatose after his double win over the weekend. We're going to labor along for a little while without him, but he'll join us a little bit later on the show. Now, I wonder if you've noticed that part of the mysteriousness surrounding Las Vegas is that every one of the extenuating factors that would ordinarily distract attention from the sheer availability, the problem of guns itself, has, actually been, has been stripped away. There is no discernible history of mental illness. There are no signs of radicalization. Stephen Paddock, as far as we can tell, wasn't a loner. He was a relatively affluent retiree. He had no conspicuous criminal history. There's no ethnic or religious identity markers that would fit this shooting easily into a narrative that politicians and pay TV bloviators alike could sink their teeth into. All there is is guns. I think because all there is is the guns, it's been kind of striking to me that U.S. President Donald Trump, who, let's face it, has never hesitated to muscle up rhetorically after incidents of terrorism in the U.S. or overseas, or in the wake of conspicuous crimes committed by, say, Mexican immigrants. This week, he sounded incredibly plaintive. He offered a kind of pleadingly conciliatory uh, uh, a speech in the wake of Las Vegas. Let's have a listen. Our unity cannot be shattered by evil. Our bonds cannot be broken by violence. And though we feel such great anger at the senseless murder of our fellow citizens, it is our love that defines us today and always will forever. That was U.S. President Donald Trump addressing the nation on Monday evening. Now, let's just leave the guns aside, though, for a moment. I think it really strikes me that there's something incredibly wrong-headed about President Trump's remarks here. Because I suppose what gun ownership represents in the U.S., even though Donald Trump is saying that what we need now in the wake of this calamity is more unity, more sense of community and the nurturing of communal bonds, let's face it, what gun ownership in the U.S. represents is in fact a kind of perverted or deformed or even distorted notion of citizenship of the community. So the alibi that we is now incredibly familiar from the National Rifle Association is that going back to the Second Amendment, it's important that the, that the U.S. have an armed citizenry in order to protect the national body against the threat of a tyrannical government. And so the whole logic of private gun ownership is supposed to be the protection of the national body. But in fact, uh, um, in the wake of the U.S. Civil War, from the 19, from the 1870s onwards, gun ownership exploded partly because of the cheap manufacturing of inexpensive guns, partly because of an incredibly effective marketing campaign. The whole purpose of gun ownership hasn't been to protect the citizens against the threat of a, of a tyrannical government. It has, in fact, been to protect citizens against one's neighbor. And I think that's where the real obscenity of gun ownership kicks into play here. That these appeals for national unity 
in the wake of a disaster like this, it actually flies in the face of the very symbolic import of the guns themselves, that we need protection from one another. In other words, I don't think it makes sense, sense at all to evoke the logic, much less the morality of citizenship in the wake of something like this. Now, anyway, Waleed's going to join us soon. He'll no doubt have lots of things to pull me up for on what I've just said. But in the meantime, uh, I'd like to go ahead and bring our guest into the program. Michael Ondace is professor of history and head of the National School of Arts at uh, Australian Catholic University. Uh, he's a longtime researcher and historian of U.S. history, and we're so thrilled that he can join us on today's show. Hello, Michael. Hello, and I'm, it's great to be here. Oh, good, good. We're, we're thrilled to have you. So let's just, let me kind of bare my soul for a moment, and you can tell me exactly where I've gone wrong. I mean, I, I thought at the end of 2012, when we saw the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, it seemed to me that this was the moment. This was the moment when these preposterously lax gun laws could in fact be changed. There was significant bipartisan support. There was, in fact, a, a co-authored bill by both a Democrat and a Republican to try to bring some moderation, if you like, to national gun laws. These, this, uh, gun, these, uh, this proposed amendment or this proposed bill attracted support from some principled Republicans like Susan Collins and John McCain. But even that bill failed. So, Michael, do you think there is any hope at all in the wake of Las Vegas, that some move can here be made? Easy answer to that, no. Right. <laughs> if, it, if it couldn't happen um, after the, the murder of those children, the six and seven year olds, the mass murder of those children, it's not going to happen now. I mean, after all of these mass shootings, there's almost a script now where the nation expresses its shock, then its sadness, uh, people offer their thoughts and their prayers, some people on one side of the debate call for gun control measures, mm. other people on the other side of the debate counter and they say this is not the time to politicise tragedy uh, and we sort of go round and round in circles. Um, I mean, my question uh, to those who uh, oppose gun control, sensible gun control measures would be, when do we talk about this? When do we actually uh, put on the table some genuine proposals um, to reform the gun situation in the United States. So it's a very pessimistic answer. Uh, it's no. But that's actually part of the logic of this as well, isn't it? That in the immediate wake of this calamity, now is not the time. We just need to be there for the victims. But then once it goes off the boil, there's no political will either. And now uh, my co-host, Waleed. Hello. Well, we talked that's about right. exactly this problem just a few weeks ago. We isn't, did, yeah. isn't the time to talk about the more systemic problems precisely when those systemic problems present themselves? Yeah, yeah. You're not allowed to talk about guns now. You're not allowed to talk about climate change in the midst of a disaster. Um, you're not allowed to talk about, I think, was it Naomi Klein who said this? You're not allowed to talk about the dysfunctional nature of hypercapitalism in the midst of a financial crisis. <laughs> that's um, right. You can only say these things when no one is listening. And I, I think there's definitely truth to that. But I think the way that you've, uh, you and Michael actually have set this up is, is beautiful for the point that I wanted to make about it, Scott, which is that I think part of the reason that these things are unsayable and the fact that this particular tragedy leaves us with nothing to look at other than guns, at least at this point, as you put it, um, we may discover something more about the shooter later that does give us something else, but for now we certainly don't have that. I think what that means is that we are left really only with the mythology that makes these things unutterable. And I think the reason that you can't mention, say, climate change in the case we mentioned before, or, or guns uh, and gun control in this case, is that to mention them is to call into question something foundational, at least on the part of those who don't want them mentioned. And what struck me as I observed this, and Michael, I don't know if you would agree with this, but what struck me is that every nation probably has its blind spot, what I've previously called its, its uh, topic of cosmic weirdness, where it just, it just cannot see what is plainly in front of it from the perspective of every outsider. And in the US, that's guns. I would say here we have a lot to do with indigenous history, uh, and I would say we have a lot to do with uh, people who come to Australia by boat seeking asylum, for example, we have a it triggers a response that's almost um, pre-rational 
um, that that doesn't really make sense to anyone who's standing outside. In Indonesia, I would say it's drugs. And I think there's something about a social and a national mythology that has these things that it throws up that are so clearly absurd, that becomes so confronting for anyone who's in those societies that the only real possibility, the only, the only real option is not to talk about it at moments like this, because it would be too painful. It would call something too existential into question. Michael, what do you think? I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think if you go back to the found, to use your word, Waleed, the foundation of the nation, there was a war of independence. Um, there was a second amendment. Uh, there was a, there was a frontier to conquer where violence was, um, you know, utterly there and present and formative to the national experience. And I think, and this is something we might um, talk about later in the program, there was also the 1960s and the backlash against the 1960s. Mm. So what I would argue is that in the 1970s, uh, a, a group of people on the hard right in the United States uh, decided uh, to, if you like, reject the excesses of the 1960s by prosecuting a kind of case uh, around the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and they really grounded their analyses in the Second Amendment, so that any attack on the right to bear arms was evidence of a federal government uh, uh, seeking to be tyrannical insofar as its citizens uh, were concerned. Uh, I think, I mean, that's I think that's incredibly interesting and I think it's incredibly pertinent and it does, I mean, it's something we've actually touched on in various ways over the last few weeks, just how important the 1970s were on a whole lot of fronts. There was a kind of fraying and breaking of the social contract in both the US uh, and in the UK. There was an abandonment of certain principles of progressive taxation. There was the emergence of a, of a new class of the urban poor. There was the dominant Republican rhetoric of, um, of kind of law and order uh, candidates and the importance of bringing uh, um, this, uh, order back to our cities. I think that's all incredibly important. There, there are two questions that I have, though, about that, Michael. I mean, one is, can we just remember that the U.S. Supreme Court did not, in fact, uh, make any, I mean, they upheld the idea that Second Amendment does not necessarily guarantee private gun, owner, gun ownership right up until 2008. It was Warren Berger in 1990. Uh, that said that the idea that that particular interpretation of the Second Amendment was a ludicrous one. But I also wonder if we're missing the importance of the Civil War here. I, I know it's it's easy to go back to the, the uh, revolutionary era, but it really was after the Civil War that gun ownership not just proliferated, but the meaning of gun ownership, I think, radically changed. It's no longer the problem of the threat of a tyrannical government. It's now fellow citizens that are potential uh, objects of, of, of threat. I would agree with that as well. I mean, it, it's not a coincidence that some of the strongest commitments that you can find uh, to guns are in the South. Uh, if you look at the coastal areas of the United States, that's where uh, support for some kind of sensible gun control legislation tends to be at the strongest. But when you, you push down into the South, uh, and into sort of rural areas of the United States, uh, you find today uh, the strongest commitment to gun ownership. The other thing that I would say is there is um, the name Obama here. Now, I'm, I'm not just deliberately bringing us right into the present, but I think the intensely negative reactions to him and to his presidency in certain quarters of the United States are also traceable, if I can put it that way, back to the Civil War. There are all kinds of things here in the mix. Yeah. Um, fears of a tyrannical federal government, the question of race, issues around violence, um, and, and fundamentally uh, questions around change in the Constitution, which go to the heart of American nationhood. You are listening to The Minefield, by the way. You can listen to the show anytime on the ABC Radio app or indeed on the radio, as you might be doing right now. You can also subscribe to our podcast. Our guest today is Michael Ondaatje, who is a professor of history and the head of the National School of Arts at the Australian Catholic University. And Michael, um, if we pick up 
the theme of, it, of the way in which that mythology interacts here, but broaden it out. So, for example, if, I, if I'm right in my suggestion that every nation has its uh, mythologically induced blind spots, then I suppose the bigger question... Okay, and we're coming up to the upload limit, so I'll be back with a new movie immediately.